I'm so sorry. So, as it turns out, you know who says he cannot come up with the cash to cover his $400 million plus bond in his New York fraud case. <laughs> so, oh. is Letitia James like gonna just- Do you need a tissue? I, I don't Here, know if dear. I'm laughing or crying. Here, put that was Whoopi Goldberg on The View. I'm gonna play the rest of that in just a second. But of course, she's mocking the inability of Donald Trump to pay or find someone to underwrite a bond to pay the uh, massive 450 plus million dollar judgment against him based on the fraud decision in New York. And what I want to do in this segment is two big things. Well, first, three big things. Number one, watch the rest of that. Number two, address a criticism that's being levied against people such as Whoopi Goldberg, which is it's inappropriate to laugh at, mock the legal woes or the seizure, potential seizure of Trump's properties or whatever it might be. That's inappropriate in some way. We'll address that criticism and we'll also get into something that i've been wanting to talk about for some time and there's a really good piece out of the atlantic about it just sort of one of the major elements going into this election so before anything else here is the rest but try to wipe the tears i, I, I don't will. see any real tears well there's no there's tears inside me <laughs> <laughs> but is letitia james gonna go like Put a, a chain on Trump Tower? Yeah. And take it like away that. from him? She said that. He doesn't have the money. His Nobody wants to lend him the money in this country anyway. Who knows what's going to happen with Russia and Saudi Arabia? Because they know that he doesn't pay his bills back. And obviously, yes. he didn't make enough money in that golden sneaker thing. <laughs> <laughs> Or the Trump uh, University, or the Trump stakes. But oh, wait, oh, wait a minute, what, or the what Trump, about every business Jared? He, Doesn't Jared have two billion still? Yes, have he does, that he got from the Saudis. But yeah. I guess Jared knows that he don't pay his bills, so he doesn't want to give him the money either. That was surprising to me that Jared is not going to give him <laughs> part of his $2 billion cachet that he got, probably only because he worked in the Trump administration. But but I, I will say this, the, to reiterate, the reason people will not lend him money yeah. is because he is the notorious for stiffing people that work for him. In 2016, when the Taj Mahal just devolved and just Who loses was money destroyed, in a casino? You know, okay. you know why he lost the money? Because he had three casinos together, two to three casinos. His actuary, the accountants told him they will cannibalize each other. He did it anyway. Yeah, he's a and punk. then a hundred contractors were not paid because of it, yep. and they lost their homes, they lost their businesses, they lost their livelihood. This happened in 2016. There is no way anybody is is gonna lend money to him, and I can't wait to see the chains on Trump Tower, actually, on Fifth Avenue. I'm like, <laughs> kind of excited about it. Can we also talk about some of So just a couple lickety-split corrections. I don't know why I feel the need to do this. I know they're just mocking him, but the Kushner deal wouldn't really it does stink of corruption, but it doesn't really make sense that he and his private equity firm would be able to just hand that money to his father-in-law to pay this sort of thing. But again, I know it's just a joke. And then even if he made tons of money off of his sneaker deal, it's normal that you wouldn't have cash on hand. You would probably reinvest that money, $500 million in cash on hand. Now, the notable part is that Trump lied in his deposition in this very case, apparently, saying that he had more than $400 million. That doesn't seem to be the case uh, in cash. And then also just recently on Truth Social said he had $500 million in cash. And so if indeed he doesn't have that money, then he's been lying, which is nothing out of the ordinary for Donald Trump. But the question of, is this inappropriate to laugh as someone myself who has laughed many times at Trump's legal peril? Um, I understand where you're coming from. I'm going to refute it in a second, but I understand why in these sorts of serious scenarios where we're dealing with a very serious subject matter, someone's property is potentially being seized, their business being found liable for fraud and them being held accountable for some massive fraudulent activities. Is it really a laughing matter? I sympathize with that question. And definitely with his other super, super serious criminal cases? Is it something that we should be cheering on, rooting on? And my answer is, I think we deserve a little bit of joy here and there. If Trump is going to inflict the anxiety 
and the pain and the division on the country that he does, do we not deserve when he's finally held accountable for his wrongdoing, a little bit of celebration? Is that really so wrong? And especially when it comes time for him to be held accountable, for example, for trying to block the peaceful transfer of power, for engaging in what prosecutors have deemed to be an illegal scheme to subvert the will of the people, disenfranchise millions of voters, and install himself as an unelected president slash dictator for, for more years or longer. Is that really something that it's unjustified to lose your mind with joy when he's eventually held accountable if he is, uh, if he is criminally? No, I think it's very reasonable. I think it's very reasonable to be excited when finally someone who for decades has avoided accountability is held accountable. And that's what we're seeing here. It's not that they made up new laws, right? It's not that they labeled him as someone who engaged in fraud when there's no evidence of such a thing. He violated laws. Now he's being held accountable for them when it comes to the fraud case. And we'll see how the criminal cases turn out. But yes, I think it's actually perfectly rational to celebrate that as much as it upsets people. But I do think it's important to explain what's actually taking place. Make sure people know this is not a political vendetta. This is not a witch hunt. This is not lawfare, as they call it. But instead, legal accountability for wrongdoing, for violations of the law. And that's how a country law and order operates. And that can be celebrated. Now, I do think, though, that we can't make this election just about Trump's legal woes. That is important. And there's a nugget of truth to some of the criticisms there that that won't end well, I think, for Democrats. It has to be about something bigger. And so you do have this against column, as I've broken down for people before. You have an against column and a for column. All these reasons in the against column as to why we should vote against Donald Trump, against his threats to democracy, against him being a civil liable rapist, against all of his legal troubles, against his rhetoric about everything. <laughs> then you have your four column and people spend less time over here, but it's also really important. And Joe Biden has provided so many reasons to vote for Joe Biden that a lot of people aren't actually super aware of because that's discussed a whole lot less. It's less salacious to speak about in the media what it is that Biden has put in his four column. Again, against really interesting to talk about and important to talk about. For we talk about in the show a lot, but in much of the media, it's not discussed too much. His long list of achievements, his stunning economic recovery, the plummet in crime, etc. I won't dive into all that into detail again because I do it so often. Instead, I want to dive into answering a question I've had for so long, which is, if that's the case, which it is, that Biden has governed really effectively, he's been a really solid president, has got a lot of good things done, pulled us out of a crisis, etc. Why don't people see it that way? Why are his approval ratings so bad? Why is the polling on this election so close? And The Atlantic put out a really interesting piece. I'll put it in the description of this video. Definitely check it out, the whole thing, but I'll read some excerpts here. It's titled, It's Not the Economy, It's the Pandemic. Joe Biden is Paying the Price for America's Unprocessed COVID Grief. And it's by George Makari and Richard A. Friedman. And they're psychiatrists analyzing this political situation through that lens. And so as we dive into this, you can kind of think of it like this. There's two categories of pandemic related outcomes that we're still dealing with that rippled through time and we cannot act like we can just skip out of that real easily, right? And the two outcomes are material outcomes, over a million lives lost, economic devastation that we had to get through because of the pandemic and its, uh, its causes, and depression and addiction and education being hindered and all these things. Okay. Material real world effects of that. Then you have emotional outcomes that are very real that we're still dealing with from that pandemic. And we cannot act like just a few years after the largest global crisis that any of us are going to experience in our entire lives that we're just going to be totally fine and everything's going to be behind us. That's ridiculous. Let me read 
some from this. America is in a funk and no one seems to know why. Unemployment rates are lower than they've been in half a century, and the stock market is sky high. But poll after poll shows that voters are disgruntled. President Joe Biden's approval rating has been hovering in the high 30s. American satisfaction with their personal lives, a measure that usually dips in times of economic uncertainty, is at a near record low, according to Gallup polling. And nearly half of Americans surveyed in January said they were worse off than three years prior. Experts have struggled to find a convincing explanation for this era of bad feelings. Maybe it's the spate of inflation over the past couple of years, the immigration crisis at the border, or the brutal wars in Ukraine and Gaza. But even the people who claim to make sense of the political world acknowledge that these rational factors can't fully account for America's national malaise. We believe that's because they're overlooking a crucial factor. And then they go on to break down that we all experienced real trauma whether it be the more than a million Americans who died during this pandemic, uh, whether it be the social and economic outcomes of the pandemic. And that is something that we were going to be grappling with for some time, no matter what, no matter who came into office, that trauma and those effects. And whether that be because price spiked because of all the supply chain issues, and that's very real and going to upset people, understandably, or the emotional impact. But what it emphasized, and this is important, and this is what really answers the question I've had of why don't people see Biden's presidency for what it is? As, as a means of overcoming that trauma, as a means of getting back to normal and getting past that crisis, we've omitted that from our timeline, that window of time that crisis. So for a lot of us, we experience time and reflect on it as if it sort of went from 2019 to more recently, just skipped over the crisis part of it. And that's why I think people then look at Biden and say, I don't perceive myself to feel as good as I felt in, you know, 2019 before a once in a lifetime crisis that devastated the world. Well, that would make sense that we're not going to just bounce back from that both materially and emotionally. And that people will have those lingering feelings. And then it makes sense that that would be directed at the president. Even though, of course, this crisis started before Biden even had any chance of doing any governing. He wasn't president. And even though we don't blame Trump for the pandemic, obviously, he did mishandle it, exacerbated these problems for all the reasons we've gone over in the past. But Trump's not president anymore. So to process this grief, as it says in this article, we're just ignoring that part of the timeline, which then only leaves pre-pandemic Biden. So then Biden becomes the one that you blame. Makes sense. Here's more. Even though hopefully people can recognize they're doing that and judge by his presidency for the incredible recovery that it's been. A recent brain imaging study showed that when people with a history of trauma were prompted to return to those horrific events, a part of the brain was activated that's normally employed when one thinks about oneself in the present. In other words, the study suggests that the traumatic memory when retrieved came forth as if it were being relived during the study. Traumatic memory doesn't feel like a historical event, but returns in an internal present, disconnected from its origin, leaving its bearer searching for an explanation. And right on cue, everyday life offers plenty of unpleasant things to blame for those feelings, errant friends, the price of groceries, or the leadership of the country. And that is what's taking place. Again, it makes sense. But if you return yourself as traumatic as it can be to what was going on when Biden took over, the just devastation that was something he had to inherit, then you, with that context, judge his presidency. You see, as we've gone through in data terms, a truly remarkable recovery. All the metrics we use to judge how things are going were really bad and slowly, in part because of his policies and governance, got a whole lot better. And so a lot of things are a lot better and good compared to how they were when he took over. And that's not something you can expect everyone to feel and to then reflect in their feeling about the president because of how long lasting these issues were going to be emotional and material. And so then it's just explained to people. And every time I've gone through this conversation with people where I remind them of 2021 when Biden became president, the disaster 
that his predecessor was overseeing and the dereliction of duty on the part of the sitting president at that time and then having to take us from that to where we are now and now the economy booming crime plummet plummeted i should say and seems to be continuing uh trending down and a historic policy record then people are like oh okay i, I get what you're saying that actually makes a whole lot more sense Here's a little bit more. I promise I'll wrap up soon. Our remedy is for leaders to encourage remembrance while providing accurate and trustworthy information about both the past and the present. Now, I'm going to toot my own horn. I've been pounding this drum, which is why this article was so <laughs> exciting to me for some time, which is not necessarily to explain it in this way, but to say, remind people of the crisis. Biden took over during a crisis. Biden took over during a crisis. Social, public health economic everything felt like it was falling apart all of us were being traumatized by that moment that's the context remember that because what the republican party's trying to make people do is collective amnesia you've heard me say this so many times and i think they use this term in the article in the early days of the pandemic president donald trump mishandled the crisis and peddled misinformation about covid but with 2020 a traumatic blur Trump seems to have become the beneficiary of our collective amnesia, there it is, and Biden the repository for lingering emotional discontent. It's so true. Some of that misattribution could be addressed by returning to the shattering events of the past four years and remembering what Americans went through. This process of recall is emotionally cathartic, and if it's done right, it can even help to replace distorted memories with more accurate ones. So interesting bit of analysis there i want to give credit again to the two whoop, authors if i can find the front page there it is george Macari and richard a friedman again psychoanalyzing america a little bit and it's very helpful so what can we do in advocating for people to vote for biden against donald trump explain why trump's a threat to democracy explain why he's an extremely low character person and want to be authoritarian and also explain to people biden's record contextualize because as i've said his list of legislative victories are significant no matter what context is there they're just significant he has been more legislatively effective as a president than any president since lbj he has been more pro-union than any president in a long time one of the most pro-union presidents in american history he has overseen economic recovery that has outpaced comparable economies the economy is doing pretty good right now, still with real economic pain being felt. Crime did plummet under his watch, etc. But remember when he took over and that being the crisis that was his starting point. Trump's starting point was a strong economy expected to continue being strong. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Biden's starting point was that disaster on all fronts. So I think it's important to remind people of that. It seems the psychiatrists agree make sure you subscribe to the channel sorry that was so long lots that i want to discuss and uh, you can become a member at lukebezashow.com slash membership